Welcome to JT Ministries. Today, Pastor Gary brings you another sermon on the book of Romans. I hope you enjoy it, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. If you are looking for a Bible, don't forget to check out the links below. There are also links to other social media platforms. Thank you for tuning in. Now, here is Pastor Gary. Let's go now to Romans chapter 13. If you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 13, we're going to pick up where we left off before I took some time off. Uh, last time I was with you, we looked at the opening verses of chapter 13 related to God and government. And now we're going to look at the closing verses of chapter 13. And uh, I'll start reading at verse 11 down to the end of the chapter. It's just verse 11 to verse 14. I want you to notice before I start to read, as I'm reading here, the language of contrasts that Paul uses to make a very important point. He, um, he's going to use terms that are opposites, that are contrasts, because he's trying to stress a very important point that will become evident as we read through this. But follow along as I read here. This is Romans 13, verses 11 to 14. Paul says, and do this knowing the time. That's very important. Underline that. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now, if you notice here, as I just read through that, Paul uses these contrasting terms. He talks about darkness and light. He talks about night and day. He talks about being asleep and being awake, and he talks about casting off and putting on. And he is using these terms to stress a very important point that all has to do with, look again at the beginning of verse 11, knowing the time. Knowing the time. I've entitled my message today, What Time Is It? Let's pray and we'll dive into this passage together. Lord, th thank you for this day. Thank you for those who are here. Thank you for our online viewers. We just commit all this to you, Lord, asking that you'd use your word to speak to our hearts today. We're always wanting you, Lord, to change us from the inside, that we might be more like Jesus. So I pray for those who don't know you, that they would come to know and surrender their lives to you. And for those of us who already do know you in a personal way, that you would stretch us and mold us and make us more like our Savior. This is our prayer, Lord. This is our constant prayer. We know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So help us in our fleshly struggles that we might bring glory to you and that we might know the hour in which we live. And we give you praise and glory and thanks together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, I think you would agree with me that our lives are pretty much dominated by time. Uh, we all manage our schedules. We all have certain appointments that we make around a certain time. Um, some of you, no doubt, are probably going to be uh, watching the time to make sure that I finish on time because you got other stuff to do. And so we're always aware of time. Airplanes take off and land according to a very precise time schedule that the FAA controls. Um, and so time is a, a big part of our lives. Uh, almost every sport ha has a clock to manage the game. The exceptions would be baseball and golf. Baseball is not controlled by a clock. Baseball is controlled by outs and innings. Uh, and golf, well, who needs a clock when you're just running around 100 acres chasing a little white ball? I don't get it, but that's okay. It's, it is what it is. We're all very aware of time, especially as it relates to our personal lives. But here's the big question that Paul is posing to us in this 13th chapter. But can you discern 
the times. Do, do you understand the times in which we are living? How much do you understand what is happening in our culture and in our world today from the perspective of the Bible? And are you aware of the lateness of the hour as it pertains to the second coming of Christ? And here's a bigger, more important question, and are you ready for that? Are you living your lives looking forward to the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Because this is what Paul is alluding to here at the end of Romans chapter 13. That's why Paul said at the end of verse 11, glance back up at the verse 11, at the end of verse 11 he says, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Now understand, when a person accepts Jesus Christ as his or her personal Lord and Savior, when you believe, you are saved at that moment. You are saved from God's judgment, you are reconciled to God, and that relationship with him begins at the moment you believe you are saved. But the fullness of our salvation is not realized until we are with the Lord. And because the Lord is returning, whether we die or whether he comes back, whichever happens first, we're going to be with him forever, and so in the sense that Christ is going to return, well, we are closer to the return of Christ than we were yesterday. So whenever you did believe as a Christian, when you first entered into a relationship with Jesus, your salvation is now closer to being realized and fulfilled than when you first believed, because Jesus is coming again. That fulfillment of what we believe is near. Paul says here in verse 11, the first part of verse 11, he says, knowing the time. The word time in the original Greek language is kairos. And it literally translates, when he says knowing the time, it literally translates discern the season. Discern the season. Listen, church, we are living in the season of the second coming of Christ. Jesus even told his disciples, like a season he will return, and you can be sure of it in Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 to 33. You can turn or just listen, but Matthew 24, Jesus said in verse 30, he says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. He says in verse 32, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. He said, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. So he said to his disciples, he says, just as sure as you know summer is near when you see the fig tree beginning to blossom and, and bud, he said, you can be just as certain that I'm coming again. The season of summer is recognized because the fig tree begins to bud. He says, you can just be as certain that my second coming is also going to happen when you see certain events unfolding in the world, know that the season is near. And if Paul was urging his readers here in Romans 13 to know the time and to be prepared, then certainly if Paul is writing in the first century, we should be more urgent and take this more seriously living in the 21st century because we're closer to the return of Christ than they were in the first century. So we have much more reason to take this more seriously and to heed his words. Paul adds here in the middle of verse 11, he says, now is high time. So in the first part of verse 11, he says, know the time. And now he says, now it is high time. The second use of the word time in the original language is a different Greek word. In this instance now, it is hora, the Greek word for hour. Uh, if you have an ESV or an NIV translation, it says the hour has come. Literally, it means we are living in the last hour. So when you put all this together, verse 11 can literally read, discern the season of Christ's return because we are living in the last hour and we are closer to it now than when we first believed. 
and he's, and he's provoking his readers, that would include us now today, he's provoking his readers to godly living while we wait for the second coming of Christ. That's basically the summary of these verses we've just read. He's provoking us to godly living while we wait for the second coming of Christ. What time is it? In answer to that question, that's the answer. The time is short. And so we are called to live godly lives while we wait for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says here in these verses, here's how you can be living while you're waiting. And he gives us five directives that I've summarized like this. Here they are. He says, wake up, cast off, put on, walk right, and think not. Now, that last point looks a little weird, and I'll qualify it when we get to it, because at first glance, it looks like check your brain at the door. No, that's not what I mean, but I'll define it when we get to it. But let's take a look at these five directives that he tells us right here in these verses. The first one there again in verse 11, wake up. He says in verse 11, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. To awake out of sleep. Now, he's speaking here figuratively, but when we think about sleep and the figurative application, you know, when we sleep, it's inactivity. Sleep is unresponsiveness. It it is a state of unconsciousness. And and if someone next to you is in that state right now, just nudge them, nudge them right now. (laughs) But but that's what sleep is. It's it's inactivity, it's unresponsiveness, it's an unconscious state, you're, you're, you're at rest. And Paul is saying here that the church has been lulled into spiritual apathy. And he says the bride of Christ has become unresponsive and inactive, and she must wake up. Jesus said similarly in Mark chapter 13, listen to Mark 13, 35 to 37, Jesus said, watch therefore. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening and midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all. And Jesus then again says, watch. So I'm reading Mark 13, 35 to 37. He begins verse 35 saying, watch, therefore. He ends verse 37 saying again, watch. It is the Greek word, Uh, Gregorio, it means be vigilant, be awake, be active. Listen, church, we must be engaged. We must be engaged because the time is short. We have to know the hour in which we live. We must be vigilant. But let me warn you, if you haven't found this out already, if you engage your faith with the times The times will try to cancel you, and the times will try to label you. They will label you because you engage your faith with the times. They will label you haters. They will label you bigots. They will label you Christian nationalists. Goodness, even if you're black, they'll label you a white supremacist. They will. It's true. Do you remember my my good friend E.W. Jackson who was here? My black brother? Pastor Bishop E.W. Jackson, they've been calling him a white supremacist for years. He laughs about it now. But it's because when you stand on Christian principles, people will throw all kind of erroneous labels at you in order, why? To try to intimidate you to keep your mouth shut and to keep your faith to yourself. That's the times in which we live. They will try to intimidate you to keep your mouth shut And to keep your faith to yourself. And if I hear one more person ever say to me, well, my faith's private. I just don't talk about it. I'm going to throw up. (laughs) That is code word for I don't want people to know I'm a Christian. Why not? Because you may not be. If you're so afraid that people are going to know who you are, then maybe you aren't really a follower of Christ. You better know who you are and let people know who you are. Because these are the times in which we live. Listen, back to the opening ceremony of the Olympics this week. Here's another headline that I got between services. You ready for this? LGBTQ leader says Olympics drag queen ceremony mocking Christians didn't go far enough. 
That's the article that they're, that they're running on the AP right now. Didn't go far enough. You see, that's their motive. We want you to keep your mouth shut. We want you to keep your faith to yourself while we just mock you all day long. Okay? We cannot remain silent, friends. We have a mandate from the Lord himself to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to penetrate our world like salt and light, and to make a difference. And let me tell you something. The church at Corinth believe that lie too. Like, we should just keep it to ourselves. You know, this is a personal thing. Faith is a very personal thing. Let's not talk to anybody. I don't want to make anybody upset. You know, all this kind of stuff. Paul rebuked the church at Corinth. Listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 34. He's, again, it's a call to wake up. He says, awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame, end quote. He said, because the church at Corinth was not verbal and didn't live out their faith, people didn't know about the truth of Jesus. And Paul calls them out and he says, I'm saying this to your shame. You need to wake up and you need to speak up so that others can know what you know and forget whatever label they might throw your way. They need Jesus. And if the church is silent, where will they ever hear it? So be unashamed. Wake up, be active, be engaged, be vigilant. Paul adds in 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 7, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch, Gregorio, and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. He says, that must not be us. We have to make a difference in our world. we got to wake up. we got to get engaged. Now listen, number two and three really go together. He talks about cast off and put on. It's verse 12 again in your Bibles, verse 12. He says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Again, talking about the urgency of the hour. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now he's talking here about the old self before you came to know Christ. And the message is, don't go back to the old ways, please. Don't go back to the old ways. Cast off the work of darkness. We are children of the light now. So put on the armor of light. Now, do you hear the implication there? He's trying to tell us we're in a spiritual battle. Put on the armor of light. Walk as children of light. In order to do that, we better know who we are in Christ. Because the world is going to try to eat us alive unless we have our confidence in knowing who we are in Christ. This is why Peter would write in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you might declare the praises of him who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who we are in Christ. So therefore, we have to cast off the old ways. We can't be living like we used to live before we came to know Christ. And by the way, it's not only about casting off and putting away the old self. It's also putting on. It's also taking on new habits and new disciplines. Listen to what Paul would write in Colossians 3, 12 to 13. He gives us a short list. Here are a few things you can put on now that you're in Christ. In Colossians 3, 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on... Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So that's just a short list of a few things to get us started. Paul's like, okay, listen, put off the old self. You're new in Christ now. Understand who you are. Get your identity in Christ. And then put on his ways. Put on the presence of the Lord. And so he says, here's a few ideas. How about you work on some tenderness? How about you work on being kind? How about you work on humility? Okay, humility is the one thing you can strive to to have, but never say that you do, right? Because the moment you say, I'm humble, you got to start all over. You got to start all over. Meekness, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is just honoring the Lord. Long suffering, being patient. Patience. How well do you do in patience, huh? Not one of my virtues, friends. I get impatient at the drive through at McDonald's, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> like, speed this line up. 
bearing with one another. Oh, and this last one that he talks about here, forgiving one another. And he says, as Christ has forgiven you. That's a tall order. So how about we start there? Just a few things to put on to be more like Christ, less like our old selves. And then number four on this list, he's, he tells us, walk right. I want you to walk right. I want you to wake up. I want you to cast off, put on, and walk right. It's verse 13. He says, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Walk properly, walk right. Now, I, this harkens back to a story that I, I shared before here. This happened about 25 or 30 years ago. I was doing a wedding at the Old Post Chapel at Fort Myer on the, on the base of Fort Myer in Arlington, Virginia. And uh, there was the wedding coordinator. I showed up for the rehearsal the night before the wedding, and the wedding coordinator meets me there. She is a general's wife, and she ran that wedding like a general's wife. Let me tell you something. And so during the rehearsal, I think this was the wedding for Tim and Lisa Haley, who are longtime members of our church. Uh, during the rehearsal, the bridesmaids were walking in what used to be 25 or 30 years ago, a kind of a common thing. It was like a staggered gait. And so they would, they would, you know, have their little bouquet, and this is the rehearsal only, and they would do this. Remember this? And the general's wife clapped her hands and stopped the music. She says, stop that, ladies. Do you walk like that normally? <laughs> the lady's like, no, I don't know, we don't know. She says, then don't walk like that in the wedding tomorrow in my chapel. Like she owned the chapel. I mean, it wasn't really hers, but like she owned it that day. You will not walk like that in my chapel. You will walk properly. Every time I read anything in the Bible that says walk properly, I always think about that general's wife. She had a clipboard. I, I'm standing next to her during the, ceremony, during the rehearsal, and when she says all that, I'm like, well, I better, I better straighten up. I, I better be turning my Bible just right, or she's going to pounce on me, you know, so... Walk properly. Now, obviously, uh, Paul is using this here in a figurative sense. He means your walk with Christ. He means your daily relationship with him. Does it reflect him or your old life of drunkenness, lewdness, lust, strife, and envy? He says, don't walk like that. That's the old person. You, see, you need to walk properly. You need to walk in your relationship with Christ in a way that honors and recognizes him, not your old ways. John would write in his little epistle, 3 John, verse 4, I have no greater joy than hearing that my children walk in truth. Walk right. The last one is think not. Now, I told you I was going to qualify this because really the rest of what Paul is saying here is think not how to gratify sinful desires. That's what he says here at the end. Verse 14, he says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Make no provision. It literally means give no thought to. If you have an NLT, a New Living Translation, it, uh, it, verse 14 reads this way. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Don't let yourself think about ways to indulge sinful desires. See, we all know this, but it's, it's worth reminding us every day. The battle to resist or to give in to temptation is won or lost in the mind. I'm going to say that again. The battle to resist or give into temptation is won or lost in the mind because we first think about it and then decide to act on it or not. This is why Paul says, make no provision. Don't even think about how to gratify the flesh because most sin, almost all of it is premeditated. I mean, we do some things, and later we go, oh, why did I do that? That was terrible. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. But most sin, we think about it before we do it. It's premeditated. 
That's why it is so important. I've quoted this verse many times. It's, it's a verse that I'm constantly wanting to work on, 2 Corinthians 10.5 myself. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. If you don't take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ, you're going to give in to temptation every time. But if you fight that battle in the mind and you take captive every thought and you say, Lord, I'm not going to go down that, that path. I'm not going to think about the, 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 these thoughts I'm having about indulging the sinful nature. And then you, you start changing your mind, thinking of other things, putting scripture in your head, do whatever it takes to not think through those things it'll go a long way to preventing us from actually giving in to temptation. And that's why Paul says here, I don't want you to make, any, don't make no provision for the flesh. Don't coddle the flesh. Don't entertain the flesh. Don't negotiate with the flesh. Okay, You can't negotiate with the flesh. The flesh is insatiable. It always wants to dominate. A person, uh, when they get saved... Their spirit is regenerated, but their flesh is not. It's not until the day that we die and our spirit separates from our body that those sinful desires will then go away. In the meantime, we wrestle. We have a battle within. And that battle is going to be won first in the mind because if we take captive every thought, then we can resist temptation. But if we entertain our thoughts, negotiate with our flesh, coddle the flesh, then we're going to give in every single time. Paul says, don't even make provision. Don't even think about it. So what time is it? The answer is, it's time to live godly lives until the second coming of Christ. It's time to live godly lives until the second coming of Christ. We need to wake up, cast off, put on, walk right, and think not how to gratify sinful desires. I'm going to close with this passage, very similar to what Paul would say to young Titus, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men... It teaches us. What teaches us? The grace of God. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That basically summarizes what we just read in Romans 13, 11 to 14. I want us to say this passage out loud and together. Can we repeat this again out loud? Repeat it with me. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, this is our prayer that we would live upright, godly lives waiting for your return. Help us, Lord, to wake up, to cast off, to put on, to walk right, to not even think about how to gratify evil desires. We want to be ready for your return. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can sense the the season, and we can know, Lord, that we're living in the last times. So help us to be faithful and to be ready for your glorious, imminent return. Find us faithful, Lord. The world might mock us, try to silence us, but help us, Lord, to always represent you well, to live out our faith in such a way that honors you. But we cannot and must not be silent because this world needs what we have, and it's the last hour. Put that urgency in our hearts for the lost, for a world that might mock us, for a world that might hate us. Lord, at first hated you. May we be faithful to be your ambassadors to a lost and dying world that they also might know Christ as their Savior. So we commit this Bible study to you, Lord. Help us to put it into practice. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 What a great service as usual. Remember, don't forget to check out the links below. Thanks for tuning in.